Sure. Well, good good afternoon, and this is Shirley Flint and Richard Flint, and we're historians, and we're going to talk to you today about our new book, Overhaul: A Social History of the Albuquerque Locomotive Repair Shops. And we're doing this today by Zoom because of the pandemic, of course, and we're all looking forward to massive vaccination so we can all get back together in person. Absolutely. We hope the next time we talk to you, that's the way it'll be. We also want to thank, of course, the Albuquerque Historical Society for inviting us to do this talk. We'll start with the cover of the book just to show you the scale of operation that took place at the machine shops in Albuquerque. This picture was taken in the 40s. And you can see the, man, the size of the man on the left-hand side of the photo there working on a part of the engine, just the comparison of size. And up above him is suspended another locomotive off of one of the giant cranes that are in the shop and they are still there visible. But today the, the book is actually covers a lot of different issues that came up with the um, locomotive repair shops, its effect on Albuquerque, its people. Um, but today three things we're gonna focus on are um, first, of course, the coming of the railroad to Albuquerque and then the second will be a pivotal, pivotal strike that happened in 1922. And the third thing is the end of steam locomotion. So a factor of major importance for New Mexico's future was the post-Civil War explosion of railroad expansion westward from the Mississippi River. On May 10th, 1869, the Union Pacific and Central Pacific joined at Promontory Summit, Utah Territory, completing the nation's first transcontinental railway line. Even before the Golden Spike Ceremony, other railroads were pushing slowly westward from the Mississippi and eastward from the Pacific Coast. Across the country in the 1870s, the clear profitability of steam-powered trains stimulated an explosion of railroad building in the West. Among such ventures was the Atchison and Topeka Railway, which had been founded in 1860 as a short-haul line. In the early 1870s, with an eye on a route skirting the Southern Rockies, the small company added the word Santa Fe to its name and slowly lengthened its line westward. After beating a competing line to Raton Pass in 1878, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe, or the ATNSF, raced toward the West Coast by way of New Mexico. Its immediate destination would be a location in the middle Rio Grande Valley, where a division point and major repair shop could be established. The Middle Rio Grande offered a major water source about halfway between Atchison, Kansas, and California. The main competitors to the site of the shops were two small agricultural towns of Albuquerque and Bernalillo. A very high price asked for right of way at Bernalillo tipped the scales in favor of Albuquerque. The official welcome of the ATNSF Railroad to the location for a major steam locomotive repair shop and the surrounding town site took place on April 22, 1880. A special passenger train carrying dignitaries from around the territory pulled into a makeshift Albuquerque station about two miles southeast of the little farming community of that name, a little after midday. Setting the tone for the festivities was the band of the all black US 9th Cavalry, better known as the Buffalo Soldiers, which was stationed in Santa Fe at the time. Enthusiasm was abundant that day and there was also an undercurrent of trepidation. But as it turned out, there was no turning back. Albuquerque would be unalterably changed by the presence of the railroad. In one fell swoop, a 19th century industrial city was born and already growing. 
By 1881, the red sandstone walls of the first buildings of Albuquerque locomotive repair shops already housed the daily labor of keeping ATNSF's steam engines in repair. And as you can see from this bird's eye view of the old shops in 1886, up here in the right side of the, this center is the shops area with the round house and uh, turntable to the north that got moved eventually. And then you can see at the top of the, this illustration, the area of Borellis and to the bottom of this illustration, the area of San Jose or South Broadway. Residential and commercial districts surrounding the ATNF shops were platted out, lots were being sold and modest homes were being built before 1880 was out. To the west of the shops grew the Borellas neighborhood, to the east, the San Jose neighborhood. It wasn't long before both areas were teeming with shop workers and their families. Again, here is another photo of the original shops, the red sandstone and the roofs were made of wood, which of course is a fire hazard as was shown in many of the workshops on the line and, and of where the shops actually burnt to the ground. So, but this is what they first looked like. This, this is the red sandstone building. And by 1900, the shops were already becoming obsolete. And that is because as you can see in this table, the length of locomotives was growing steadily bigger over time. And you can see in 1887, the length was about 34 feet. And in 1905, it had gotten to 48 feet. And by 1923, it was 61 feet. This change in the locomotive size required replacing the, all the major shop buildings, which was begun in 1914. And that's because the original shops could not handle an engine of the length of 60 feet. So as they began to clear the land for the new shops in 1915, and this is a rare photo actually of any um, African-Americans involved with the shops. So this is a crew that was hired from the Springer Transfer Company who were gonna grade the sites with mules. However, World War I interrupted the completion of the new shops. After the war, construction resumed and rather than building with the older materials of stone and wood, the new shops were steel and glass like the Ford Auto Plant in Michigan. These new buildings marked a wholesale departure from earlier norms of American industrial architecture. The new steel girder framework permitted a wider roof span that could enclose work floors and accommodate, in this case, as many as 26 of the longer locomotives. This is a modern photo of the famous completed North Wall. It was um, in the erecting bay. This construction of steel and glass allowed for natural light to flood the workspace and for hot air to escape through open windows. You can see in the foreground, here are the inspection pits for each of the bays and the rails on which the locomotive came into the shop. This is a drawing of the floor plan, which took up three and a half acres of floor space and was divided into four key areas. Starting from the north, which is down at the bottom, we have this first, the biggest area, which is the erecting bay, in which they dismantled and reassembled the locomotives. And it has the giant cranes in this part of the building. The next section behind, divided by a wall, is the um, heavy machine bay. So you have the erecting bay up front and 
next south is the heavy machine bay, which dealt with wheels, and drive rods, and other very heavy pieces of metal. The third area going south is the light machine bay, which um, dealt with the repair of smaller rods, levers, tubes. And finally, at the back of the building in the south part is the bench bay with actual work benches in which they dealt with the smallest and precision parts. This is a aerial view of the whole site um, showing actually the round house as it used to stand and the turntable inside just to the um, west of that, this long building. Here is the storehouse with the Wheels Museum is in this structure now. And this structure to the right of the roundhouse is the um, shops building. And you can see this tallest roof is the um, erecting bay and it, the various different sections we talked about go are in that giant building structure. And then across the transfer table is the boiler shop and perpendicular is the blacksmith shop. And of course you can see the upper part of this photo shows Varelis in the river and the foreground is the San Jose or South Broadway area. And as I said, that transfer table, which is between the um, erecting bay to the left and the boiler shop to the right is the apparatus that allows the um, locomotives to enter and exit, oops, sorry, the um, machine shop by coming out to this transfer table and onto this uh, platform and then this box that's in the middle is going to operate the transfer table and push the train either transversely, either towards you or away from you and put the um, locomotive back on the track or it brought it into this space and then allowed it to go into the shops on, the, on its rails. So now Richard. This is, uh, this photo is in here. Uh, this is a um, Chesapeake and Ohio steam locomotive um, in the uh, early 1930s. Um, but this is a disaster that was not uncommon uh, it, for steam locomotives. This is a, the results of a boiler explosion. Um, there were many other things that could happen uh, and disabled local steam locomotives, but this is one of the more spectacular things. And uh, you can see that uh, the explosion pushed the front end of the, of the uh, locomotive completely off. And uh, the force of the explosion pushed many of the uh, superheating tubes from the boiler just right out the front like spaghetti. Um, remarkably, this particular locomotive was taken to a shop much like the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops, but in Ohio and was uh, rebuilt and remained in service for another 20 years after this boiler explosion happened. This is uh, back in Albuquerque though. This is, uh, as Shirley was talking about the erecting bay. And uh, we have this photo in here for several reasons. Uh, first, it shows multiple locomotives being worked on simultaneously. You can see uh, right down the line uh, a, a whole group of um, steam locomotives. And to the right of each locomotive, you can see the end of the inspection pit. You can see the ends of the inspection pits here on the floor of the shop. Um, so that's how they work. The locomotive was straddling that inspection pit so that men could get down in that inspection pit and work uh, on the underneath side of, of the locomotive without um, extreme effort. Um, however, um, most, um, 
most overhauls, if, well, truly a complete overhaul, required that the body of the locomotive had to be lifted off the running gear, disconnected from the running gear and lifted off by these huge cranes. Uh, the biggest ones, one is at the top of this photo, way up here just along the margin of the, of the photo, uh, 256 pound cranes, 256 ton cranes. Uh, could lift up the entire body of the locomotive and they were traveling cranes so that they were on rails and could slide transversely through the, through the erecting bay to move the, the uh, body of the locomotive to some other bay and set it down again on pedestals or whatever uh, to get it out of the way while they worked on, uh, well, while they worked on it, the body uh, separately from the, from the running gear and then to work on the running gear, to dismantle, to take the wheels off the axles, things like that. In the uh, lower part of this photo is a parts car um, that is, um, this was something that was always, always there, both for, they had to have a, a parts car for bringing in replacement parts or cleaned parts, uh, and uh, another one for old, used, broken, discarded parts. And that's one of those here in this photograph. Here in the sort of middle ground at, in the uh, height of the, of the recting bay is a smaller, and there were two of these, smaller um, traveling crane uh, that could also lift heavy parts, could not, were not meant to be lifting the entire locomotive, but uh, could lift very heavy things like uh, wheels and axles and, and such. Uh, this is a photograph from 1948, as the caption says. Uh, this is uh, ATNSF 3914 uh, being dismantled as part of an overhaul in 1948. You can see the number of uh, people involved in just stripping down locomotive. It's, it's, it's a swarm of people all working simultaneously to basically take off every single part that was removable. Had to come off uh, and that means down to nuts and bolts. It had to be reduced to a pile of nuts and bolts basically and parts. Uh, so there were thousands of such parts and they had to all be taken off and it was uh, difficult work because of course after the parts had been on the locomotive for a year or two. Uh, some parts were now sort of frozen on, nuts were stuck, uh, bolts were broken, all that kind of stuff. And th those always presented problems. So you see men here working on various parts of, this is primarily the barrel of a locomotive. Uh, they are going to tear it down to nothing. And Every single one of those parts had to be cleaned and inspected and checked against a, um, a book of specifications. Each locomotive carried that book in the cab of the locomotives uh, because every locomotive, virtually every locomotive was different. Uh, they were built in very small lots between six and 12 usually so that there were no more than 11 other locomotives, generally speaking that were theoretically identical to any other locomotive. Always, other, otherwise, they, there had been changes made and they all had to be have their own uh, list of specifications. And when you have thousands of parts, uh, it, it really took a big, it's a, they were big heavy bound books. And each time an overhaul was done, those books of specifications had to be amended so that even locomotives that were theoretically identical in their, the beginning of their service life, uh, after the very first time they were overhauled and they were being overhauled in this time uh, about every two years, completely overhauled, torn apart and built back up every two years. Uh, but by the first time an overhaul had happened, uh, things had been changed because of problems that had occurred things broke that had to be repaired and they re repaired differently, slightly differently. So now the specifications were a little bit different. So each locomotive ended up with a unique 
service manual in effect. Part of what you see there, let me go back to that um, previous one. Uh, you can see towards the front of the barrel of this locomotive, you can see a small area of white material here. Um, that is asbestos. Uh, every square inch of the barrel of the locomotive had to be coated, covered with asbestos. And then that was covered over with a, uh, a jacket of sheet metal, which you can see much more of. This is all sheet metal put over the asbestos. And so part of the job of dismantling a locomotive was to remove all that, remove the jacketing, remove the asbestos underneath. And of course, when you build it back up, you have to put the asbestos back on. And generally speaking, you had to make, fabricate a new jacketing. Uh, and this next slide is uh, the plan for um, ATNSF 2926, the, uh, the locomotive that has been rebuilt here in Santa Fe and, and now put back in running order, um, was in a park here in Albuquerque for many years and over the last uh, almost 15 years has been restored to operation. But you can see that every single one of those numbered boxes there, pieces, rectangular pieces, generally rectangular, pieces of sheet metal had to be cut individually and put in place and welded in place every time the locomotive was overhauled. And that's just sort of the beginning. This is just an inkling of how complicated working on a steam locomotive was. Um, we'll give you just a little bit of an idea of, of you know, some of the really incredible work that was done in the locomotive repair shops here in Albuquerque. This is uh, in the um, blacksmith shop. And this is not at all your craftsman blacksmith shop. These are gigantic power tools. So this is a huge hammer uh, that is pounding out a draw bar uh, in 1943. Took a crew of three men uh, you see the hoist that is holding the draw bar uh, as it's coming through the hammer. And that big hammer is dropped down and just wham, wham, wham. The, the shops were a very noisy place. Lots of noisy things were happening. You think of frozen nuts. Uh, you've got people with sledgehammers hammering on wrenches to try to loosen up frozen bolts and nuts um, and uh, those kinds of things were going on all the time and you've got 26 bays with potentially uh, 26 locomotives usually they weren't all full simultaneously but uh, but many locomotives at a time with at various stages of being dismantled or or rebuilt and much of that stuff was very noisy it was all extremely dirty because ordinarily the locomotive after coming, coming in off of road work for uh, two years or more uh, was filthy dirty. Uh, grease, oil, uh, encrusted with dirt and um, fine particles of ground metal, uh, anything you can think of. It was just incredibly dirty. Uh, this is a, another photo from 1943, also in the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops. This is one of several time clocks that were in the shops. Uh, the men in this line are checking out for lunch. Uh, lunch was not paid time. Um, so they have to check out when they leave for lunch and check back in when they come back. And you can see the man in the front of the line with his lunch pail um, and their safety reminders on the, on the schedule. Uh, this is a photograph from 1937. We got this photograph from one of the people, one of the descendants of um, a man who worked at the shops. Um, and this was his sort of class photo. There, there were 
the uh, ATNSF and most railroads actually took year annual photographs of their personnel, of their crews, um, all posed uh, on some specific day each year uh, as reminder to them and record to the company of who was working in the shops at that time. And uh, this is not like I say, 1937. And that's the, um, again, they're, they're standing and, and rising on the, on the uh, transfer table. And uh, that's the machine shop behind them. This is one of four uh, lavatories at the Albuquerque Locomotive Repair Shops. And by lavatories, they meant absolutely clean up. This, was, this is the only purpose of this, these huge rooms was cleaning because as I said, the work was filthy, dirty work. And you can see from the man who is looking at us straight ahead in the front row, how dirty a person get, uh, got uh, doing the kind of work that was done at the locomotive repair shops. He's just beginning to clean up. The guy next to him is well on his way to getting clean, but uh, you can see his hands are completely blackened from however long, I don't know if this is a morning or an afternoon shift, but, uh, but every person you know, had to go through this rigmarole at least twice a day. They were going out for lunch, they cleaned up, cleaned back up at the end of the day. Uh, and clothing was also a problem because it got completely filthy and caked with grease and oil. Uh, so in the area around the shops, in both uh, the Borellis and uh, San, San Jose neighborhoods, uh, there were quite a number of laundries, many of which uh, boasted that they were they would steam clean your clothes uh, because it was hard to get that stuff out of the out of that fabric. This is another photograph, nineteen forty three, and maybe I should mention that we have a there are an incredible number of photographs of the Albuquerque shops from 1943 because the Farm Security Administration, one of the uh, alphabet soup organizations in the Franklin Roosevelt administration um, had sent a photographer named uh, Delano uh, to Albuquerque specifically to photograph the work of the locomotive repair shops uh, and uh, he did some photography on the railroad line also, but he took many photographs of the work going on in the shops. And consequently, uh, for that year, especially 1943, we have quite good documentation of the, of the work that was going at the shops. Uh, this is the west gate of the shops uh, on 2nd Street. They're, the men are coming out of the gate onto Second Street. Uh, the building um, behind them that has the Santa Fe logo at the corner up here is the uh, storehouse. That's where the Wheels Museum is now. Uh, you can see the 230 foot tall smokestack here of a power plant. They, they were generating their own electricity and had been since the early days of, of, the, of the shops. Um, most of the power machinery was being run by electricity generated by coal. And that coal, <coughs> much of it was coming locally uh, from the Cerritos coal fields. Um, this is, uh, we're gonna turn to uh, a, our second sort of major inflection point that we're gonna talk about in the life of the shops. Uh, in Albuquerque. And this has to do with strikes. Um, there were two really important strikes that happened uh, that affected the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops. One in 1893, which uh, was a nationwide strike and, and began towards the opening act, you might say, in the uh, panic of 1893. Um, it was a nationwide strike among shop workers, railroad shop workers, and completely shut down railroad traffic in the United States. As you might imagine, it didn't last long. Uh, 
because trade in the United States came to a complete screeching standstill. Um, so it began in April, early part of April, 1893, and by the end of April, it was over. And the, uh, the employees, the union members, they were already members of unions, it was the AFL, um, they, were, um, they were successful. They had um, gotten raises that they, they, that they wanted. Uh, this map was published in the Albuquerque Journal uh, shortly after the, shot, uh, the strike began in April of 19, um, I'm sorry, this is, I'm getting ahead of myself because this is the second strike of 1922. Um, it actually started in July of 1922, almost the beginning of July. And this map was published in, in <clears throat> July of 1922 in the Albuquerque Journal. So this is the second major strike and after that first strike in 1893, the companies, the national railroad companies had banded together and basically made a pact that no strike like what happened in 1893 would ever happen to them again. And they entered into compacts with the governors of the various states and, they, and contracts with Pinkerton uh, detectives and uh, they had, they were ready for um, any strike that might happen in the future. And this was the first really big one that happened after 1893 and they were ready. The, uh, you can see the map shows the stippled areas that are sort of the little dots uh, are areas where there was violence in the United States during this strike. Uh, the, Clear state areas are places where there was little or no violence. That includes New Mexico. Can't say there was none. We have records even from the Albuquerque Journal of uh, fairly minor incidents of interpersonal violence during, during the time of the strike. But uh, by and large, compared to other parts of the United States, compared to many parts in the Eastern United States, um, New Mexico was quite peaceful. And we uh, think that that was at least in part because uh, Albuquerque was a division point. Uh, it was the headquarters of the Southwestern Division of the Atchison Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. So there were lots of um, management officials here in Albuquerque and they had daily knowledge of the people who worked in the shops here. They were familiar. They, would recognize each other. So that, that kind of relationship, uh, I think, made for less, like, uh, less likely that there would be huge um, um, fighting, um, you know, violent confrontations. There was plenty of disagreement, however, and families broke apart here in Albuquerque, um, didn't talk again for a long time. Some migrated away because of the strike. This is a commemorative button, not from the time of the strike, but from several years later when things could be remembered in a happier way. But you can see it was called the Big Railroad Strike. And uh, it was a major event across the country because it again was a national shop workers strike, railroad shop workers strike. And the reaction to the strike nationally by the ATNSF was to fire the strikers. Uh, about a thousand uh, shop workers went out on strike on the first day of the strike here in Albuquerque. This is an ad from uh, a little bit later in, the, in July of 1922, um, again from the Albuquerque Journal, um, seeking uh, to recruit new employees, uh, machinists, boilermakers, sheet metal workers, electricians, and all the other crafts that went into making and repairing locomotives. Um, these, were, um, these were skilled positions. Um, they were well paid for their time. Um, so when uh, they went out on work, 
it was really a uh, threat to uh, rail transportation in the United States. And that's exactly how the companies treated a threat to their very existence. And they reacted in that way. So um, they, the company was, of course, anxious to hire people to replace those strikers. Ironically, um, quite a number of striking machinists and boiler makers and other craftsmen um, simply moved to other repair shops, uh, other railroad repair shops, and took jobs, which really defeated, helped defeat the strike. And uh, the companies brought in massive numbers of um, replacement workers, scabs, as the as the union uh, members would call them, uh, and the uh, this strike did go on for months, but um, it was fairly it, it started to uh, the striking started to wane almost immediately, even though some at some shops uh, striking went on for seven years, unbelievably. Not in Santa Fe, not in Albuquerque. The strike itself, the 1922 strike, had a huge effect on the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops. And one of the effects was it changed the composition of the workforce. It changed the ethnic composition of the workforce. When the railroad came to Albuquerque in 1880, they brought their own employees their own shopmen, their own machinists, their own boiler makers, their own sheet metal workers who were already experienced workers from the East. And many of those people had in turn migrated to the United States from Eastern Europe. So you had a huge number of um, either um, English speaking or um, people who spoke languages from other part, from parts of Eastern Europe, Polish, German, uh, such languages, uh, and other languages, European languages, Italian, French, I mean, you name it, uh, were working at the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops. But that meant that local, local people here who lived in the Albuquerque area uh, had a very hard time getting work, certainly in the upper echelons of the various craft skills. So you see, we, we've listed in the, in the caption up here that six job classifications. We've got machinists, and you have three levels of machinists, journeymen, apprentice, and helpers. And they were all here. So same with boilermakers, journeymen, apprentices, and helpers. Well, local Hispanics, there, early on, there were no journeymen in either category of boilermakers or machinists. And that's because there really weren't any machinists who already knew, had, had uh, experience in doing machine, mach steel machining uh, in New Mexico at the time. There, there weren't those kinds of shops here. Uh, people didn't know how to do that, so they could only do that by learning how to do that. And eventually that happened. And one of the things we see in, in this chart shows it very clear, clearly. If we look at 1919, we had 28, well, almost 29% of the machinists and boilermakers at the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops were Spanish surnames, so presumably local um, Hispanic people. Um, by nine, that's three years before the 1922 strike. In 1925, three years after the uh, 1922 strike, that percentage had increased to 50.3% Spanish surnamed. And that's because when the company fired um, employees, skilled employees in 1922, they didn't want to hire them back ever, which gave an opening to people who were already working at the shops say at the apprentice or helper level, say an apprentice boilermaker or an apprentice machinist might move up to be a journeyman and uh, become one of those select 
uh, employees who became, well, probably already was very skilled, but became recognized for their skill and very likely completed an entire career with the AT and SF. So by 1925, as I say, 50.3% Spanish surnamed in machinists and boilermakers. By 1943, that was even higher, 63%. Uh, and that's because, in part, because the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe had a policy of family hiring. They liked to hire relatives of people they already knew were good, skilled workers. And so after 22, 1922, when increasing numbers of Spanish surnamed Hispanics uh, who were working in the higher levels job classifications in the shops, their relatives more readily got put on, got hired on at the Albuquerque shops. And so the, the uh, number of Hispanics at the shops just increased and increased and increased. <laughs> now, this is uh, we're going to jump to our, our third sort of transitional step in the life of the shops. Uh, even though this photograph is from 1935, uh, even before World War II, the uh, Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe was a big booster of diesel electric locomotion. And they actually put, purchased and put into service the very first diesel electric locomotive in the United States. And this is it. It was pulling the Santa Fe Chief uh, on the ATNSF line in 1935. And, uh, but even though the company was gung ho to convert completely to diesel electric locomotives, what intervened was another world war. And so uh, when the United States, first when Europe and Asia were enmeshed in, the, in World War II, uh, and the United States was shipping all kinds of material and uh, goods to both those theaters of war, uh, there wasn't time to be replacing all these locomotives. They couldn't just be at a standstill at any, any point. So they just put it off and that continued through the whole war. But when the war was over, the ATNSF was back at it full throttle. And this is a, uh, an ad, again, in the Albuquerque Journal from 1953, boasting that they were adding a new diesel electric locomotive to their uh, fleet of locomotives uh, every three days. Um, and that they were, had absolutely committed to uh, ending the use of steam locomotives Simultaneously in the United States, so had every other major railroad. So all the railroads, all the major railroads in the United States were simultaneously phasing out steam engines and replacing them with diesel locomotives. This was an advantage to the companies because diesel lo locomotives are more durable. They don't have to be repaired as often. They have uh, they were able to use standardized parts, something they had never had with steam locomotives. As I said, they had batches of six and 12 locomotives at a time in steam locomotives so only, but in diesel locomotives, you could have hundreds of different models that were all utilizing the same uh, diesel engines and the same electric dynamos. And uh, so that they, they could all be interchangeable, not exactly, that's not quite exactly true, but much, much, much more so. There were only a few variations that were necessary. So that for the companies, this was a, a, a real windfall. They could make a lot more money because not as many repairs had to happen. And when they happened, they were easier to make. They required fewer workers to make them. Uh, for, so for the company, this was a great thing. For the workers, the shopmen here at 
the Albuquerque locomotive repair shops and all the other hundreds of locomotive repair shops around the country. It was disaster. In the course of six years, between 1949 and 1955, ATNSF completely phased out steam locomotives. You can see that in 1949, the blue line is, represents the number of steam locomotives uh, were just a shade under 1,400. By 1955, that number had declined to less than 200. And the very last steam locomotive on the ATNSF line was, operate, was taken off in 1957. There were no more active steam locomotives on the ATNSF. And in contrast, that orange line represents diesel electric locomotives, and they did exactly the opposite, going from about 600 in 1949 to 1600 in 1955. And as I say, that was a, that was a disaster for shop workers. It meant that here in Albuquerque, it meant that um, the Morelos and um, San Jose neighborhoods, especially, uh, lost population just right and left. During this whole six years, the, 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 the rapid decline was happening. Um, the company, ATNSF, kept sending delegations from what was then their headquarters in Chicago out to Albuquerque to actually uh, talk to the shopmen to explain that they were not going to show, close the Albuquerque shops they didn't have to worry about their jobs, but every week there were more layoffs at Albuquerque, every week, and almost as often, another delegation came from Chicago to say, don't worry, don't worry, we're not gonna close the shops. It's, you're gonna have jobs. Uh, they're always gonna be work for you guys here. And of course, by 1955, it was, it was absolutely clear that that was not true. The, Shops did continue to be used not to repair steam locomotives. There was a, apparently a small amount of even diesel uh, repair work that was done at the shops, uh, but mostly they were repairing uh, road service equipment, railroad service equipment. So uh, machines that would lay track or pull up track or build uh, trestles and bridges and. Uh, those, those, that kind of equipment, much smaller scale stuff than the huge locomotives they had been used to working on. And therefore, the, the number of people at the shops declined and declined and declined until when the shops finally closed in the 1980s, completely closed. I mean, they, they just stopped completely. There were only about 175 employees where there had been 2,000 uh, during World War II running three, three shifts around the clock, uh, whistle blowing four times a day to signal a change of shifts. Uh, the whole city could hear that whistle, uh, that huge steam whistle. It allowed everybody in the city to reset their clocks four times a day. Uh, and uh, that all was gone. This is just Purchasing information about the book, uh, Overhaul of Social History of the Albuquerque Locomotive Repair Shops. Um, uh, you can see the price, 1995, and uh, it's published by the University of New Mexico Press um, and is available for, from lots of local retail booksellers, uh, including Barnes and Noble and Bookworks, and is also for sale at the Wheels Museum here in Albuquerque and of course from Amazon. We're now, uh, that's our talk and we'll shift now to uh, questions. We'll make a transition here. Yeah, quick bit. Let's see, there's a, here's some questions. No, 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 he's gonna, well, maybe he's, We've got our sound on. 
So we have a question from Steve Egan. You want to start at the top first one? Oh, so what were the typical work shifts over the years of the Albuquerque shops? Did they change from the early 1880s to the 40s? Yeah, absolutely. The, the shifts, the shifts changed, and we, there were various sort of uh, work regimes uh, during the life of the shops. So it's not really possible to give you uh, an answer that would apply all the time. But we have uh, fairly good information from uh, from both people who worked at the shops, who we interviewed, and their relatives to uh, for during the war. So during the 40s and then uh, into the early 50s, uh, the shops were ordinarily, uh, the first whistle would be 7 a.m. Um, and the work was supposed to start at 7.15. One of the people we interviewed remembered he would um, wake up, he was an apprentice at the time, a sheet metal apprentice. Uh, and he would, he lived only three blocks away in the shops. Many, many of the shop workers, by the way, lived very close by and could walk home to, to and from work. Uh, that changed over time as Albuquerque expanded and the shops expanded. Um, but um, he woke up in the morning, would hear that first whistle. He said he would throw his clothes on and be in work at 7.15. Uh, I don't know if that happened religiously or every day, but um, anyway, it was it was a it was a way for him to cut it as close as possible. Um, and then, uh, like I say, lunchtime was not paid, so that was that didn't count as a work time. But there was a noon whistle or a noon-ish whistle, and then there was a uh, whistle at about five o'clock. Uh, in the afternoon. During the war, there were as many as six whistles that were blowing as, as, the, as the number of shifts expanded to three, so that each, um, each shift would be marked, the beginning and end of each shift would be marked, plus the eating times. And so it, it got to be very complicated. There was, whistles were blowing a lot dur during World War II. And they were used for other reasons too. It became a, a citywide signal for emergencies, for instance. But um, anyway, there were there were various systems of um, of uh, different of uh, different um, shifts shifts at the shops. Um, Let's go and on. also, Steve wanted to know if any other non at &SF railroad companies brought their locomotives to the shops. Huh. Uh, I, don't, I would say generally no. I would, I would say no. I, it would not be impossible. It would not be impossible. But uh, we never heard or saw any information to that effect. But there would, I think the, the problem would be that... Uh, the locomotive models were peculiar to the railroad companies. ATNSF, early on, in, by, by the 1880s, was all, already doing all of its own design work in-house at, um, at their shops in, Atchison, in Topeka. In Topeka, they were designing all their locomotives themselves. They would then ship the stuff, the plans, off to the various railroad companies, the locomotive companies, and the companies would then fabricate them. Uh, but eventually, at &SF gave that up too and did all their own fabrication and design. Uh, they, were, they led many of the design changes that uh, came to steam locomotives over the years. So anything else from Steve? Well, just Steve? saying that the at &S had enough locomotives to keep themselves busy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that at the, during, during the peak time, which was World War II, a little bit after World War II, uh, a little over 2,000, they were running a little bit over 2,000 locomotives, at &S was, on a regular, you know, a daily basis. So that, that's a lot of locomotives and it took, they had four um, 
major machine shops on their lines. Um, then they moved to six. And then, of course, when they moved to diesel, cut back. But, um, but there were, and there were uh, shops all over the United States. So when steam locomotion ended in, like we say, 1957, and during that period of 1946 to 1955, um, the, um, I forgot what I was going to say, the, um, ah, that was going on all over the country. And uh, when, during that period, 250,000 railroad machinists, so shopmen machinists, lost their jobs in the United States. It was a, it was a huge disaster, not just for shop workers here in, in Albuquerque, but all over the United States and increasingly all over the world as, as the world shifted to diesel electric. Okay, so Paula Hernandez, um, she wants to know, did we find any records with workers' names in any payroll or anything like that? And one thing we found and consulted was that the railroad had a monthly magazine and it was actually pretty chatty and newsy and they would talk about individual workers had a baby or went on a holiday or, or got hurt, if, if that's what happened. And you can pick up people's names that way. Also, there are payroll records, correct? That were, there, they're uh, stored at the Kansas. In the Kansas Historical, Historical State Historical Society because that's where the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe main records went. Uh, when the when the company ended, uh, they went to the Kansas State Historical Society. But the Kansas State Historical Society, because the payroll records were so huge, you know, weekly pay records uh, in gigantic books. I mean, like two feet by I don't know two and a half feet, huge books. Flip them open, and that'll give you a, a few months of payrolls at Albuquerque. Uh, so they were so voluminous that they decided they could not possibly keep all of them. So they selected um, years, actually, I think months from years to, uh, to retain. So, but they are available for anyone to see at the Kansas State Historical Society, uh, those payrolls. Is, who is who we found out someone's going to really look into this? We found that out. It, yeah, you would ask that. I, I can't. I can't think. I don't know if it's Paula herself. No, no, no. No, it's, <laughs> no. Not. No, it's not. Someone is work, going to uh, work on this. Navarrete. Um, oh. Cecilia Navarrete um, has, has done some work already with, with payrolls. And she gave a presentation at Wheels Museum, uh, oh, within the last month. And uh, they, they might have a recording of that, of that presentation if you were really interested. Uh, let's go to Charles, Charles Larrabee. Larrabee. He says, great book. Can you, can you please. Uh, please discuss the development of the ATNSF hospitals due to the dangerous work and injuries to workers? Yeah, that, that's an interesting subject. We touch on it a little bit in the book and show, we have a nice photo of the hospital. But um, ATNSF did establish a hospital pretty early on for exactly that, the injuries to the workers, and paid for their care while they were recovering. Um, eventually, they built another big hospital, which is the Park Hotel now. That's, I forget, is that a letter? one of those central or central, I guess, um, central at the freeway. Yeah. Anyway, that's the old ATNSF hospital, which again was to um, cater to the workers and their families as a worker's benefit. Yeah. I believe, we believe a little bit was taken out of their paychecks. Well, we know it was because the, the, uh, the railroad first was offering it as a free service. Uh, originally, but within just a few years, they said, oh, we can't afford to do this. So they started deducting a dollar a month from every worker's employee, from every worker's paycheck 
to support the hospital. And, um, but that continued through the entire time that the ATNSF was functioning as an independent uh, company. And uh, he, he, here's something that's sort of related to this, this is from Sharon Lukacs. Uh, ATNSF merged with Burlington and is now headquartered in Fort Worth. Did you research there? Uh, we didn't. We did not research uh, at the at the uh, Burlington headquarters at the at the BNSF headquarters. Um, but that's but, because their records. But that's because the, are in Kansas. Yeah, the, the real the records of ATNSF are, are not there. Uh, they're not. They're simply not there. They really are. There there are some that are scattered around. There are some that are here in Albuquerque. Some important records. The uh, Center for Southwest Research at University of New Mexico, for instance, has a has a collection that has largely not even been cataloged yet of documents that remained from when the uh, when the shops here closed. Uh, but uh, but the certainly the big sort of consistent and systematic official records uh, are in Kansas, and um, there fortunately that is a a very well run um, archive and um, they are taken well care of. So if there aren't any more questions, well, I think we should just Okay. Do you want to we'll wait just a couple minutes, see if anybody has any more questions. Yeah, see if there are any more questions. Um, it's Did that come up? No. Okay. I think, no. I keep, every time we say. Yeah, we there. see that Paula Hernandez, yes. his grandfather, she says worked there for decades. Yes, that's, yes. That's great. That, that's neat. And one of the things that uh, sometimes you can, you can use, and we use them successfully in uh, working on this book, was, uh, to use the city directories for Albuquerque. Um, they are, um, they're more fine grained than the census records and um, they um, work very well for, we, we, could wa we could watch uh, individual families through the years, for instance, and we did uh, this, who were um, relatives of shop workers and by the way, they were often, as, as we sort of mentioned before, there were lots of family members often working at the shop at the same time. So if there'd be multiple people from any given family who were working at the shops and lots of people therefore have memories of those relatives. And when the, I'll just make this one more point, which is that when the shops closed and during that, really six year period that we pointed out of from 1949 to 1955. Um, the, as that happened, uh, shop workers had to uh, look for other work and many of them uh, moved to Southern California and eventually became employed in the aero and aerospace industry. So there, there are many people here in Albuquerque who have relatives who still live in Southern California for that very reason. They were former uh, ATSF uh, locomotive repair shop employees, had a very high skill knowledge and were able to transfer that knowledge and, and get good paying jobs in the aerospace industry, which also required lots of um, precision machining. Paula, I see. So Sharon Lukacs. How do you say her last name? I said Lukacs, but I don't know. What sorry, it I'm Sharon. So sorry if we aren't pronouncing it correctly. So why were the shops built near the Borellis neighborhood where most of the employees living there? Well, the question is, no, there were no employees living and there. there. Was, and no there, such place as this that, Borellis that, neighborhood. There were a few houses uh, that were associated with farm fields that were here before the uh, railroad came. But just before the railroad came, the, some of the names you'll recognize, um, like Stover and 
what's his name with the castle? Hooning. Hooning Castle Prince, guy. Prince Hooning. They bought up they the bought land. They bought up the land. Where on the right, on either side of the of the rail line, and platted out the the neighbor, the, what we know as the Borellis neighborhood streets so, and all. So there was no such thing as a Borellis neighborhood until the railroad arrived. There, there was a place called Borellis, but it was just this sc scattering of a few houses. And then they platted out the house and built the houses, which when you go down there, you'll see are, are very small lots, and very like 50 feet wide and 100 feet deep. And they were sold to those railroad workers that were brought from the east. And yeah. they built these houses that they were used to, not adobe, but, you know, wood framed houses that they were used to and that's who lived in them eventually because the railroad insisted that their workers live very close to the shops yeah and there's, there's actually a gate on the east side i mean the west yeah the east side as well that would allow the san jose neighborhood workers to come into the shops from that side but that yeah. all happened really after the railroad yeah. So, right. so the the those two as neighborhoods, uh, those two places are really a creation of the railroad. They they did not exist before, and there were not any people living there before. I mean, except for the few people who lived in those farmhouses, and who were farmers, uh, there weren't any any people. So um, that's you in in some sense you can say there wasn't. The new Albuquerque, which is what they called it, to distinguish it from Old Town Albuquerque, New Albuquerque, which is what the railroad called the place that they started, uh, was really built from scratch, platting out streets and, like Shirley said, and, and building houses. There were there were very few to begin with, and it didn't even wasn't even sure that it was going to be a success at the beginning. Uh, but by the end of uh, 1881. Uh, it, we, there were a lot. There was lots of building going on, and uh, the the number of people just kept increasing. But for a long time, people remember uh, hearing their relatives, their ancestors, talk about Borellis and uh, and San Jose neighborhoods, uh, and saying that they were Germans who were all living there, and well. That wasn't probably literally completely true, but there were a lot of people from Eastern Europe and the Eastern part of the United States who early on, that's where they lived. And so there really was this, this cultural divide between New Albuquerque and Old Town. Uh, you know, people who were involved in a very different life here in New Town, as opposed to the agricultural uh, life of people who lived in in Old Town Albuquerque. And also just, I think the location also had to do with how close to the river. The river made a, makes a big bend there toward the Southeast and it's coming closer to the area yeah. of, the, of the rail yard. So, cause they needed all that water and that, and obviously the other bend up where Old Town was, was taken by Old Town. So. Part, that's part of one reason to have the, the rail yards there. And I guess Paula hmm. wants to know what we do. <laughs> yeah, well, what was our background? <laughs> well, we, our backgrounds? <laughs> we, we are professional historians and trained, university trained and associated with universities um, historians. Uh, our usual um, focus has been uh, the Spanish colonial period in the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. Uh, but we were intrigued by the shops uh, and uh, decided that we had been asked by Lieba Fried, who was the president of the Wheels Museum on the grounds of the shops. And she said they needed a book about the shops and would we think about writing one? Well, we thought about it and and uh, we decided well, we give it a try and four years four years of research uh, we were able to put together a, a, a pretty thorough um, treatment of the history of the shops and what and the, and the people who, who worked there 
So I guess that's I, th I think I think that's probably about the end about the end of it. And we thank you all for for listening and and watching and hope that the next time the Albuquerque Historical Society has a, has a, has a meeting, a meeting it'll be in person. it can be in person. <laughs> so thank you all and we'll look forward to the next time.